Hello, chart watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a quick look at the market. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average backing off of the uh, the move that we made yesterday, down a little bit today, down 85 points. The S&P 500 uh, just barely lower, down uh, just under two points. The NASDAQ is back up near the high of the day. It is up seven and a half points. And the Russell 2000 uh, off of its earlier lows, currently still down uh, just a little under three points. 10-year Treasury yield after a really strong move yesterday has pulled back a bit today, down about two basis points, but that was a huge move it made yesterday. We'll see whether or not we go back down or whether we can continue this uptrend in yields. It would be better for the market, for the stock market, if uh, the 10-year Treasury yield were to continue that move to the upside, in my opinion. Volatility index, six of the last seven days, it has been lower. It's getting back down close to that 13 level. Low volatility normally associated with bull market runs, so we'll keep an eye on that. Communication services having a strong day today, along with materials. These are the two good groups. And consumer staples lagging today. One of the big reason, uh, one of the big reasons, drug retailers getting hit to the downside after Walgreens Boots Alliance came out, not only missed top line and bottom line, but then lowered guidance going forward. This is a group that has been underperforming, as you can see, for quite some time. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a bit, but uh, the group not doing well, and obviously the uh, Walgreens report not helping. Uh, one group, though, that has been a bright spot today and really over the past four or five trading sessions, as you can see, is airlines. Airlines up more than 3%, actually almost 4% today, uh, bucking the overall trend with the market not really doing much. Airlines very strong today, though. And I did notice earlier, pull up the dashboard, I think if you look at the scooters and the movers on the large cap, look over here, you've got Delta, uh, then you've got uh, United, and so forth. So you've got a number of the um, airlines littering the top of the uh, scooter movers. So uh, pretty good news, at least uh, for the last week, because airlines were under a lot of pressure prior to that. Okay, Aaron, it's day two of our anniversary week. I am excited. We got a lot more in store for everybody today and the rest of the week. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. I heard uh, online somewhere that you are getting snow today. Oh, do we have to mention that? <laughs> I literally had just forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah, it actually was sticking, believe it or not. I mean, it was 70. I played golf. It was 78 on Friday and uh, 80 on Saturday. And here it is Tuesday. I go outside. It's 34 and it's snowing. Wow. Yeah, not happy. Not happy. One week from Thursday, the Masters starts. And the Masters isn't that far from me. Augusta is not that far from mm -hmm. where I live. And uh, to be seeing snow right now is just crazy. I thought we were done with this. Yeah. I I mean, we're. I think we're pretty much done with our cold weather here in SoCal. So <laughs> I, I am sorry to hear that you're still having problems there. That's all right. I'm overlooking it. It's too big a week here at Stock Charts. I can't let it get me down. Exactly so much. Uh, and you know, today's going to be a great day, but we're also going to have a great week as well. We're still going to be seeing Gaddis Rose, Martin Pring, and John Murphy. So we'll be talking, uh, looking at videos with them and uh, having discussions. So it'll be really exciting. And for today, as we said, jam packed session today. So we have a couple of really great videos for you. One is the history of 1999, mainly because of course, that's when stock charts uh, was birthed <laughs> is 1999. Greg Morris, we have a video. I sat down with my dad uh, to talk about decision point and stock charts. And then of course we have our 10 and 10, Sally Beauty Holdings, and we're gonna do a segment on relative strength at the end. So let's go ahead, kick it off, Tom. Technical news and headlines. All right, let's take a look at the economic reports out this morning. We had February durable goods out. Um, it was a weak report, but the market was expecting a weak, weak report. Uh, you can see it dropped 1.6%. Market was anticipating about the same. And then we strip out the transports. Uh, February durable goods rose one-tenth of 1%, which was pretty close to matching the expectations of a flat reading. So overall, nothing huge there. And when we move over to the 10-year Treasury yield, you can see we are down, as I said earlier, down about two basis points. 
I would actually like to see us get back up above that 20 day. You can see we did it back at the beginning of March, didn't last and really never took out the prior reaction high here, which was up at 280. So that just tells me that the overall downtrend is in play until you begin to start trending higher, putting in higher highs and higher lows. That did not happen. We started moving down uh, really a uh, tumble in March in terms of the Treasury yields. But we did bottom on the 27th and we've been moving higher. So the question for me is, can we get back up through that 20 day and back through 2.55 percent? Because that was the support from January. We lost that just a couple of weeks ago. Now, can we get back up through it? So those are a couple levels that I would be watching in terms of earnings reports. Uh, we did have a couple of earnings reports out. It is slow right now. Uh, but the big one was Walgreens Boots Alliance. They came in, they missed missed on their bottom line, buck 64 versus a buck 70. Uh, Lamb Weston uh, had a really good report. So it was really uh, the tale of two different uh, earnings reports. Walgreens Boots Alliance missed top line, missed bottom line, lowered guidance. Lamb Weston beat top line, beat bottom line, and raised guidance. And we'll take a look at both of those charts so that you can see what is going on there. But it really isn't good news with uh, WBA. And of course, this is a Dow component. So if you want to know why the Dow is underperforming today, you really don't need to look any further than Walgreens Boots Alliance down 11.5% uh, today. So this is weighing on the Dow. You can see it's not light volume. This is a really big move to the downside, heavy volume. Could this be an exhaustion gap to the downside? It could. You don't know until later. Uh, I do know in terms of volume that it's the type of volume that could be exhaustive. Um, and we have been in a downtrend overall. But there's a lot of things that just don't look good to me about Walgreens. And number one, when you look at the overall group, the drug retailers, they've been going down, um, not rallying. Once we got to about the middle part of February right here, we turned back down. So you shouldn't really have been expecting too much out of this report. Not only did the group turn down, but look at what Walgreens has been doing relative to its group. So with the group turning lower, Walgreens has been an underperformer. So you can imagine the underperformance versus the S&P 500. The market already knew this was coming out. That's what the beauty is of looking at these relative charts, in my opinion. A lot of times they tell you a story before you hear the story. And Walgreens, uh, underperforming for three or four months, now comes out with the bad news. The report, they missed on their top line. It was $34.53 billion was the actual number. They were expected to come in 34.57 billion, so not that big a deal. A uh, buck 64 on the bottom line, market anticipating a buck 70, but they guided fiscal year 19 earnings per share lower to 598 versus 638, and so that is not good when you start taking a seven percent haircut. And remember, when you go through valuation models on trying to project a value for a company. One of the thing you're, things you're looking at is discounting future cash flows. Well, if those future cash flows start to drop, obviously your valuation is going to come down as well. And so when once you lower guidance for one quarter, depending on who's doing the valuation, it could be an impact going beyond even that quarter. Um, didn't listen in on the conference call, so I don't know if that was uh, just specific to the next quarter, but still not good news. And you can see until the market begins – to send these shares higher. And until we begin to see drug retailers turning higher relative to the S&P, I would steer clear. There's just no point in trying to catch a falling knife uh, like Walgreens has been. The other stock that reported, and we can take a look here, this is Lamb Weston. This is in the food products area. The stock did gap up, it's pulled back. I'm kind of interested to see when it gets to gap support, um, which is getting close. I mean, we closed yesterday just below 74. So once we get down to, say, about 73.95 or so, is this stock going to turn back around to the upside? I don't know. The overall group, uh, we saw what the drug retailers have been doing. Well, food products actually did make a breakout. And when we scroll down, you can see that on a relative basis, it has been underperforming over the past four or five months. But we're off of the recent um, relative lows. And we saw that uh, bounce off the relative support from October. So there are some good things, some bad things. I would say mostly bad things because the overall group being in a defensive area here, not really performing well versus the S&P 500, but you got a stock that just came out and posted some really good numbers and raised guidance. They guided their fiscal year 20 revenues and earnings per share higher. 
Their revenues came in, by the way, $926.8 million. Uh, the market was expecting $898.5 million, so there was a $28 million beat there. Uh, that's about 3% above expectations. And then bottom line, $0.95 cents versus $0.82. Cents. So all in all, it was a good report. I think this company has been performing pretty well on a relative basis, but it's the overall group, again, not quite performing up to the standards of the S&P 500. And I think that's holding the stock back here a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about Lyft. Lyft, um, not really getting a Lyft. Lyft has been under pressure since coming out with its IPO at $72. It opened back on Friday at 87 and change, got above 88, and then sold off all day long, closing back down near 78. Yesterday, opened at 75, sold off, finished near the low of the day, closed around 69, and now today putting in new lows. They did come out, uh, Seaport Global Securities initiated Lyft this morning with a sell rating and a target of $42. Uh, not exactly what you want to see if you bought the stock at the open at 87. So uh, LYFT off to a rough start in its first couple of days of trading. Uh, I find it very difficult to trade something like this because, again, I'm looking at technical analysis. It's a study of price action. We have almost no price action. We have three days history. So I think this one's got to settle down a little bit. I'm not interested in it right now. Um, Amazon. Now, Amazon came out, announced they were cutting prices on many products at Whole Foods. And a couple of stocks that have been struggling. Whoops, wrong uh, symbol there. Uh, a couple of stocks in that space have been struggling because of this announcement. Kroger's, you can see getting hit back in earlier in March. But the last couple of days could not get through the 20 day. We're rolling over testing the earlier lows. We'll see whether or not they hold. And if we pull up the relative chart on Kroger's, you're going to see that the, the group, food, uh, wholesale, and retail, not doing that badly. But look at Kroger relative to its group. This was even before the announcement came out from uh, Whole Foods and from Amazon. So market saw this coming. Uh, you can say that news doesn't leak. I think you can look at the chart and see that it absolutely does leak. Uh, you've got analysts always talking to these companies, finding out what's going on. And so they go back, they sell, they get their clients to sell, and then we see the fundamental news come out. Uh, but this is not good news for KR. And I could go into a few different companies here. NGVC, take a look at uh, NGVC Natural Grocers. Look at this stock just continuing to drift lower. On a relative basis, it's an absolute horrible performer in this group. Wouldn't want to touch it. GNC. Uh, same thing on a relative basis, down near its relative low. Uh, Sprouts Farmers, SFM, same thing, moving down, relative stock or relative uh, uh, move down to a 52-week low. Uh, one more, United. Um, I think this was, yeah, United Natural Foods. Been an underperforming underperformer for a while. Didn't really get impacted too much here the last couple of days, but you can see it has been an underperformer for many, many months. So that's what you definitely want to avoid. Now, as far as the consumer uh, consumer staple space goes, I did just want to mention we're hitting overhead price resistance. We hit it yesterday, testing that November high and now beginning to roll over. I would watch resistance at yesterday's open. And on a pullback, I'd look for this rising 20-day moving average to hold. We'll see. And that is all I have. I'm going to let Aaron take it away with some upgrades and downgrades. All righty, and away we do go. I had a couple of them you might be interested in. I'm actually looking at one right now as far as upgrades. Right now I'm looking at Laboratory Corporation, LH. This one was upgraded today by Jeffries from a hold to a buy. And right now they've moved their price target from 154 up to 190. So they're looking at price to test the overhead resistance uh, for the past year. So we'll have to take a quick peek at this one later on, but I like the little tiny breakout. We certainly haven't closed above that area. And you can see in the thumbnail, especially that the current trading price is just below that area of overhead resistance formed by that short-term top uh, from March. But you could see that the um, PMO is doing what we wanna see, turning up, getting ready to cross its signal line. It, you know, it's somewhat overbought. I mean, we've gotten the PMO all the way down to minus six. 
But really, that's coming off of a, a really large decline, of course, back in December. So this isn't really that normal for it to get this low. Uh, but I still could see this not being too overbought at the moment. Um, I, I think you could still get up to a, a plus three and uh, watch it from there. But I thought that was an interesting upgrade. Let's see if we can get this to close. Uh, the other one I looked at just before was Quest Diagnostics, DGX. This one, Jeffrey's upgraded from a hold to a buy. They have raised their price target from $93 to, let's see, all the way up to 107. Uh, so they're not, they're looking for a test back here, probably of the highs that we're seeing uh, back from some of the consolidation zone. I would be looking closer here for my target personally uh, at about 111.25. Uh, but in any case, got the nice breakout. I see a flag formation here. Um, you know, typically reverse head and shoulders are continuation patterns, but I mean, uh, reversal patterns. But I think you could still make a case for sort of a, an unusual one with this being a left shoulder and that being the right shoulder. But I thought uh, as far as the textbooks were concerned, it, it really is a flag more than anything else. And, re and really it doesn't matter because we got the breakout. We're currently trading above that overhead resistance. PMO is doing exactly what you want it to do. All right, next upgrade I have for you. LYB, Lionel Bissell Industries. And you know, it's been in a trading zone and it really hasn't gotten out of that trading zone yet. But apparently B of A Merrill uh, has moved it from an underperform to a buy. So it really uh, pushed up its, uh, it pushed up what it's thinking about as far as this, instead of going to neutral, just underperform straight to a buy. And the current target right now is at 105. And you can see that lines up pretty much over here with the overhead resistance from back in October. But you still have to get out of this consolidation zone. And it's really making the attempt today. And I guess with uh, B of A, they're really looking for this one to do well. Let's go ahead and look at Hostess Brands. And I absolutely love their symbol, TWNK. Uh, you know, the first thing that came to mind when I saw this was a short-term uh, parabola, meaning you're getting more and more steep uh, on your rallies. And then typically these end up uh, in, in not the way you want them to. Typically they're gonna break down and they break down very fast and they go to the last uh, area of support uh, from a basing pattern point of view, that would be right around here at that 1125 area, in my opinion. So I, uh, I'm, I'd be a little unsure on this particular upgrade. Obviously, uh, the investors are liking it today. Uh, and you could see it come all the way up here to that 1375 to close that gap. Uh, but I would just, you know, this would be uh, certainly a demonstration of chasing a stock if you were to get in now. Let's go ahead and we're gonna look at two downgrades. Uh, Bernstein downgraded KKR from a market perform to an underperform. Again, uh, you know, skipping kind of along the way here. I don't like the way that the PMO is turned down below the signal line, but of course, a lot of that has to do with what's going on today because a PMO is calculated real time. But I have to say, I don't, I don't see this one going too far. I think a downgrade is, you know, makes sense at this point. Uh, pretty much in a consolidation zone, hasn't left. I would be looking honestly for a test of support if we lose that 50-day EMA down to about 22. And then finally, the last one we'll look at is Wingstop. And uh, Wingstop was downgraded today by Guggenheim from a buy to a neutral, and they have moved their target to $72. So basically right around where it's trading. You can see a major breakdown of that short-term rising trend, and it is testing the top that we saw back in February, currently trading above it, but did dip down below. Uh, I'd be looking for some support here at $70 if you don't get it. Um, I would certainly be out if I were stuck holding it through today's move. Uh, you do see the PMO is turning down, so I, I wouldn't be looking for any uh, bounce or upside here. And that is all I have for the upgrades and downgrades. 
And there you go. You can see them. I'll have them up in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Yesterday, Chip Anderson walked everyone down memory lane, highlighting the path of StockCharts.com over the past 20 years as we celebrate this milestone anniversary this week. If you own a business or have owned a business, you know how difficult it is to sustain that business over 20 years. It requires vision, an innovation, uh, great products, a great team, responsive customer support, and so on. We're extremely proud of our past and thankful to all of our Stock Charts friends for your support over the years. Just a question. Do you remember key economic events and big headlines from 20 years ago? Check this out. The Euro. January 1st of 1999 was the creation of the European single currency or the Euro by the European Union. It was first introduced to the world financial markets as an accounting currency, replacing the former European currency unit. It wouldn't be until 2002 that notes and coins would start to circulate throughout the European Union, with it being the official currency of 19 of the 29 member states of the Union. It is the second largest reserve currency as well as the second most traded currency in the world after the US dollar. As of August 2018, with more than 1.2 trillion pounds in circulation, the euro has one of the highest combined values of banknotes and coins in circulation in the world, having surpassed the US dollar. Michael Jordan retires again. Michael Jordan, widely regarded as the greatest basketball player ever, retired for a second time on January 13, 1999, after capturing six NBA titles as a member of the Chicago Bulls. Jordan's individual accolades and accomplishments include six NBA Finals MVP awards, 10 scoring titles, five regular season MVP awards, 10 All-NBA First Team designations, nine All-Defensive First Team honors, and 14 NBA All-Star Game selections to include three All-Star Game MVP awards. In the world of entertainment, when the Blair Witch Project premiered at the Sundance Film Festival on January 25, 1999, its promotional marketing campaign listed the actors as either missing or deceased. Owing to its successful run at Sundance, Artisan Entertainment bought the film's distribution rights for $1.1 million. It had a North American release on July 14, 1999, before expanding to a wider release starting on July 30th. The Blair Witch Project grossed nearly $250 million worldwide on a modest budget of $60,000, making it one of the most successful independent films of all time. President Clinton's acquittal. The impeachment of Bill Clinton, the 42nd President of the United States, was initiated in December 1998 by the House of Representatives and led to a trial in the Senate on two charges, one of perjury and one of obstruction of justice. These charges stemmed from a sexual harassment lawsuit filed against Clinton by Paula Jones. Clinton was subsequently acquitted of these charges by the Senate on February 12, 1999. The Columbine Massacre. At the time of the attack on April 20th, 1999, the shooting at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado was the deadliest shooting at a high school in United States history. Two students entered the school and went on a shooting rampage, killing 12 students, one teacher, and then themselves. Columbine resulted in an increased emphasis on school security with zero tolerance policies. The incident also resulted in the introduction of the immediate action rapid deployment tactic, which is used in situations where an active shooter is trying to kill people rather than take hostages. According to a study in 2018, since Columbine, 223,000 students at 229 schools have experienced gun violence. South Africa's first black president. On June 14, 
1999, Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa, stepped down. The 1996 Constitution limited the president to two consecutive five-year terms. Mandela did not attempt to have the document amended to remove the two-term limit. Instead, he had only intended to serve one term, age being a strong factor in this decision. Mandela retired from active politics and became, for several years afterward, engaged in a number of philanthropic activities. The death of John F. Kennedy Jr. On July 16, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. departed from Fairfield, New Jersey at the controls of his Piper Saratoga light aircraft. He was traveling with his wife, Carolyn, and sister-in-law, Lauren Bassett, to attend the wedding of his cousin, Rory Kennedy, at Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Kennedy had checked in with the control tower at the Martha's Vineyard Airport, but the plane was reported missing after it failed to arrive on schedule. On July 19th, the fragments of Kennedy's plane were found by the NOAA vessel Rude. The search ended in the late afternoon of July 21st when the three bodies were recovered from the ocean floor by Navy divers. The dot-com bubble. The late 1990s saw an unprecedented rise in technology stocks fueled in large part by the growing use of the internet. The NASDAQ home to many of these internet-related companies, rose five-fold from 1995 through early 2000, including an astonishing 86% in 1999 alone. The dot-com bubble burst, however, as the 2000 bear market arrived. The NASDAQ fell nearly 77% from its high in March 2000 to its bear market low in October 2003. Many smaller internet-related companies were bankrupt by the end of 2001, unable to turn a profit with no additional funding available. Even technology giants like Cisco Systems, Intel Corporation, and Oracle Corporation lost more than 80% of their inflated value. The NASDAQ did not regain its dot-com peak until April 2015, more than 15 years after its dot-com period high. Y2K. Fueling fear for much of 1999, and especially the final few days of the year, was the Y2K problem, or the Millennium Bug. It was a class of computer bugs related to the formatting and storage of calendar data for dates beginning in the year 2000. Problems were anticipated because many programs represented four-digit years, with only the final two digits making the year 2000 indistinguishable from 1900. The assumption of a 20th century date in such programs could cause various errors, such as the incorrect display of dates and the inaccurate ordering of automated dated records or real-time events. Crucial industries and government functions could potentially stop working at 12 o'clock midnight, January 1st, 2000. All over the world, companies and organizations checked and upgraded their computer systems. At 4 a.m. as the new year passed, on the little island of Fiji, we discovered that the Y2K bug would not cause impending doom. Internet facts and milestones. The number of internet users worldwide reached 150 million. The estimate is 4.4 billion for 2019. The Melissa email virus infects more than 1 million computers worldwide, causing more than $80 million in damage, clogging up email systems around the world. MySpace was officially introduced to the internet. The first full release of the Bluetooth wireless standard was released on July 16, 1999, defining a low cost, low power consumption protocol for uniting electronic devices from different manufacturers into a single secure connection. On June 1st, 1999, Napster was launched. Napster was the name given to three music-focused online services. It was founded as a pioneering peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P, file-sharing internet service that emphasized sharing digital audio files, typically audio songs, encoded in MP3 format. 
the company ran into legal difficulties over copyright infringement. Wow, it is hard to believe that it's been 20 years since many of those events took place. Uh, clearly, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, hopefully, that helped put things in perspective as to just how long StockCharts.com has been providing great stock market tools, education, and commentary. Um, Arthur Hill, Senior Technical Analyst here at StockCharts, joined us yesterday on Market Watchers Live, and he discussed how he initially connected with Chip Anderson and the events that led him to join StockCharts.com. Listen in now as we hear about Murphy Morris joining StockCharts.com many years ago. Hi, this is Greg Morris. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, John Murphy and I started a modestly named company named MurphyMorris.com back in 1995. We had both traveled a lot. We met at Financial News Network's Green Room back in the 80s and uh, became pretty good friends. And I had John at a seminar in Dallas and uh, was taking him back to the airport after he gave his presentation. And uh, I paid him, I think, a thousand dollars honorarium. And uh, I asked him, I said, you've been gone from home for three days and you've made a thousand dollars. I said, what do you think of that? And he said, well, I'd like to make a lot more. And I said, well, I, I travel and I don't get near what you get for that. And I come home after three days of speaking and, and uh, hardly have any money to put in the bank. And so that's what caused us to start Murphy Morris. And we were going to sell videos. We both had written books uh, training tapes and do seminars. And we struggled initially. John was still on CNBC a lot. So we had literally thousands of followers. And then I was reading a marketing book. I was an engineer. And so I was reading a marketing book one day by reason trout and it talked about branding. And I realized the light came on that John Murphy was our product. He wasn't just my partner, but he was my product. And so I started selling John Murphy and Murphy Morris really took off after that. We were at a uh, Traders Expo in Las Vegas in 1999, and I think it was being held at Bally's. And uh, we we always had a nice booth right in the center of the trade show. We I could always negotiate good positions with uh, John as my brand. And uh, this this guy comes over and and introduces himself said his name was Chip Anderson, and he, he wanted to know if we had time to look at some software that he had at his booth. And and I, I'll share with you that we, we got asked a lot of times to go see somebody's product, somebody's software, because John Murphy, like I said, he was very popular and very famous from, because he was on television. And the pat answer was almost, uh, I, we just don't have time right now, but Chip was persistent. And so I went over there and looked at it, and he showed me the dynamic yield curve and the perf charts. And I literally was blown away. Uh, I had never seen active charting things like that. You know, they were Java, Java apps or applets, whatever they call them. And I was just kind of dazzled by them. And the perf charts were especially interesting because Murphy was always good at talking about sector analysis and the perf charts that he, uh, I think the chip had were all the, the nine or 10 S and P sectors. So, really caught my attention. And so I decided to go back and bring John over. John came over and he was equally dazzled. And so at that point, I'm not sure of the chronology, if it's exactly right, but we ran into Chip two or three times at trade shows and he was always very nice and uh, showed us whatever new things he had and talked to us. Uh, I was the webmaster at Murphy Morris. In other words, uh, I was an old programmer, but I could tell by <laughs> To that year 2000 that my my abilities were just very limited and uh, it it was kind of a struggle for me to continue doing the webmastering and the other thing that I had a problem with was ho people to host our website I I had a place in Dallas that was doing it for a while and then I went to an individual who convinced me he could do it in his bedroom that was a giant mistake and then I went with another large company and uh, it just, I just had a lot of trouble getting people to host our website. And I, I it always came back to us. And at, at one point chip called and, and said, I was telling him this story and he said, well, I'll, stock charts will host it. Stock charts started hosting Murphy Morrison and, and it really took the load off of me uh, because chip was, 
very good with the technology and uh, always liked to talk about it. I always enjoyed listening to it, even though I didn't understand half of what he said. But, and we, we kept running into trade shows. And uh, I think it was about a year later in the late spring or early summer of 2002. I don't know whether it was on a phone call or I was up in Redmond or it was a trade show. I don't remember where it was, but Chip kind of meant some, something about acquiring Murphy Morris. And uh, it just kind of rang really well with me because I was tired. I was uh, running the whole show for Murphy Morris and uh, we were traveling all over the place, uh, scheduling John and getting speaking arrangements and arranging seminars. It was, it was a one man show actually with, with John as the product. And so that sounded very interesting. So we, Chip and I went back and forth, uh, I think with email and phone calls for oh, four or five months. And um, after uh, lots of discussions, Murphy Morris was acquired in October 2002. And Chip was smart enough to know not to just shut it down, but he slowly merged components of Murphy Morris into stock charts and and uh, Murphy Morris' name kind of hung around for quite a while. I don't remember how long. It seemed like quite a while. I think I think Chip really wanted John Murphy to be one of the chief technical analyst commentators for stock charts. That was his primary goal. In 2006, I stayed on it as, as a consultant, advisor. Uh, it was just part of the, the sale. Didn't work with Chip for, oh, I guess six or seven years. I mean, stayed in touch with everything, but did, did no, no association with me working with stock charts. Then at an IFTA conference, International Federation of Technical Analysts in San Francisco in 2013, I was one of the speakers and uh, Chip was there and he came up and asked me how I was doing. And we sat down and talked for a while. Laura, my wife, Laura was with me and we, and we had a really great conversation and we, we stayed in touch. Uh, then I was speaking at the market technician, the MTA, the Market Technicians Association meeting in New York City. I was one of the speakers and they were in a venue which didn't have a, a giant auditorium. Uh, and so like Perry Kaufman, Martin Pring and me and a few others, we had to rotate, uh, give like two two speeches in the morning and one in the afternoon and one the next day or something like that. And, and it was basically, they wanted us to give the same speech. Well, that's harder to do than you can imagine. But anyway, I noticed that Chip Anderson was sitting in the back of the room and I think he sat back there for two of those speeches, which were the same. And I thought that was odd. But so he approached me about considering writing a blog for stock charts. And I think my first response was, I don't have time. And then he said, well, I listened to you for an hour and I heard at least 25 articles in that hour. And he said, it'd be real easy for you to do. You've written, you've written books on modern finance and technical analysis. Uh, and he really was convincing. And I said, well, let me consider, let me think about it. Cause I was trying to retire. And uh, I thought, well, I could do this at home. I don't have to travel sound like something I'd really like to do. And so I've been writing a blog called Dancing with the Trend on stockcharts.com since I think almost four years now, maybe three and a half, but I've written, I do know that I've written 176 articles and I don't write like most of the other blog authors. I don't write about what the current market's doing. I write about my 45 years experiences as a technical analyst and I'm very blunt and very honest about it. Keep, I think Chip calls me the curmudgeon. Uh, I have no problem being critical of modern finance. Uh, in fact, I've written books on being critical of modern finance. And, and it, so it brings something a little different to the blog table at Stock Charts. And I've been doing it ever since. And so that's, that's pretty much how Murphy Morris uh, became part of Stock Charts. And how come John Murphy became the chief technical analyst at Stock Charts. And I'm now one of the blog authors at Stock Charts. So that's it. It was great hearing about Greg Morris and how he joined Stock Charts with Murphy Morris. But I got to sit down with my dad yesterday and we recorded a video where he talked about how Decision Point came to Stock Charts. And I think there might be a few interesting and enlightening facts that you may not have known. So take a look. 
So I have my dad here, Carl Swenlin. We decided since, you know, Stock Charts is celebrating 20 years, that it would be nice to sit down and, and let everybody know how Decision Point got involved with Stock Charts. And, you know, I don't think everybody knows, but we've been associated with Stock Charts now for 18 years of those 20 <laughs> that, that Stock Charts is celebrating. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about how it all got started? Right. Uh, you, you remember that uh, comedy show, WKRP? Oh, yes. Cincinnati? Okay, well, they, they had a show where they were all involved in some major upheaval at the uh, radio station. And Herb Tarlick, the sleazy ad guy, uh, jumped in. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. How does this affect me? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So with, uh, we're concentrating on uh, the, the stockcharts.com anniversary, but it really has to, you know, in our, in, from our perspective, you know, how did it affect us in, uh, in our transition through the years? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I started uh, back in the early 80s uh, very um, – intensely in, interested in the stock market and uh, did a lot of my learning watching a local FM TV show on uh, KY TV was what it was. KY. Mm -hmm. and they had a show 30 minutes after the market closed called Gene Morgan Charting the Market. And I learned a whole bunch of what I know today, the basics anyway, uh, watching that show. It's been, it was a really unique show. And, uh, well, uh, I can remember, you know, racing home, uh, from work at noon. So there, or at one thirty one, so that we could go and make sure we got to see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was back when they started having v VCRs and you could record shows. So used to do that, but that was a, a big deal. Anyway, um, I worked on my own for about 10 years, and then in the early 90s, AOL was becoming very popular, and I found a stock market message board dedicated to fundamental analysis. And I was uh, fairly confident in my abilities at that time, and and uh, kind of an intersection of preparation and opportunity. And I convinced uh, the AOL personal finance people to give me a technical analysis message board. And uh, a, a decision point officially became a business in August 1992 with, uh, when I received my first check from AOL. Um, on AOL, I had a message board and a file library. There wasn't any such thing as clicking on a link and bringing up a graphic in those days. And uh, the uh, I would do two da two year daily charts on uh, the Dow Thirty Industrials, and that was on Friday. I would do this and upload them to the file library. Friday night, and it took one, uh, I'm sorry, two to three hours to upload those 30 years files <laughs> at 1,200 baud. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that, that's the uh, that's a term we use for uh, uh, internet speed back before we had uh, light speed. Right. <laughs> today. <laughs> anyway, and uh, in about two years, AOL changed their business model and I was forced to build my own website. It was a horrible experience, but I also developed a niche for DP by designing indicator charts on uh, MS Excel. And it was, um, the charts were really good, I have to say, and virtually non-existent. There were indicator charts and it just you just couldn't find them on the internet. I, at, at one point, I was able to, I was producing about 150 indicator charts daily 
using Microsoft Excel and Apple Script, and it was just totally overloading my computer. Uh, I once in a while it would crash in the process, but it was just um, really good stuff. And uh, published on the website using this masterful uh, program called AOL Press. That was the publishing program for website that I had acquired through AOL, of course. Mm-hmm. And then um, our, our first website was launched about uh, December 1998, and there you go. <laughs> there could be a logo on there to make it look a little better than that, but it was pretty primitive. And uh, then uh, a little later, in uh, about, yeah, about a year, half, maybe six months, a year later, we had the improved website. That that was pretty good looking site. I think it looks good even today, to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this process, some we became friends with Greg Morris. Um, he contacted me uh, because he liked the work I was doing with the decision points charts. Uh, and I was just really pleased to meet Greg Morris of Murphy Morris. Dot com, and uh, he told me that I should uh, check out stockcharts.com and talk to Chip Anderson, who he said was scary smart, which is true. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so I looked at the stock charts websites. I liked their uh, chart styles and presentation. And I called and introduced myself to Chip and uh, asked if he had heard of Decision Point. He said he, he actually did know De- Decision Point. And uh, we were some of his inspiration for de- developing the stock charts uh, charting pro- or design. Now, I don't want to make that seem too important, but it was a really important thing to me to think that he, that he knew uh, what I was doing. It was... Uh, a big deal. I'm not sure exactly what it, how he said, but he, he said we were really important. <laughs> <laughs> still are, still are. Yes, still are. So um, I said I'd like to have him uh, stock charts produce our charts uh, on their chart engine, and he came down. Uh, we met for a few hours, and in a few days we find signed a five-page agreement to partner and. Uh, they would they would maintain our website and generate our charts. Um, it was just fantastic advance for us, and really took a lot of load off me. Absolutely. Uh, so the first design they came up with uh, for the website, you have that's the next graphic. There you go. And then um, there was then the next one they came up with in uh, two thousand four. And that's the one we stayed with until uh, um, they purchased Decision Point in uh, uh, November 2013. It was a great day. They took over data production and all the charts were moved to the server. Yeah, I was absolutely thrilled as well. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, it just basically, I was getting pretty close to the burnout point at that point. And so it was a great uh, load off my shoulders and the next uh, the uh, website the old s- server finally died and the next uh, graphic is uh, a signpost directing people to stock charts yep that was pretty exciting we had a lot of people a little unsure of it you know when we started uh, moving over there but I have to say the decision point faithful and followers are still with us I mean, I still recognize names sometimes when people email me as somebody that I saw back when I was doing the billing <laughs> for the original Decision Point site. So yeah, we're, it's been a great it's been a great uh, benefit to Aaron and I, and uh, we're just really happy. There's there's what stock charts looks like now, and you can find Decision Point content buried within it. (laughs) 
not buried too far. You just go to that articles tab and you'll find this page right here when you click on the decision point blog. But uh, it's been great. And, you know, now I'm so glad I talked you into doing that Friday show with me. For right. Point. Because we're doing charting the market with uh, Carl and Karen Swinland. Exactly. <laughs> we used to sit and have our lunch and watch uh, Gene Morgan. And now we get to do what Gene Morgan did. Only, I think, way better in terms of uh, what we have at, access to us for, from stock charts. Absolutely. All right. And that was my dad telling you all about how Decision Point came to stock charts. I don't think a lot of people know that Decision Point had been around for so long. And it's, it's great to be able to tell the story. And I, I have to say that uh, the commonalities I noticed between Greg Morris and my dad was that both of them were at that point where they just were so overworked and they really, I know my dad was ready to just kind of throw up his hands in the air and, and I told him I'd take over uh, the business, but before I could really do that, uh, Chip came in. So uh, I appreciate that too, because I've been able to concentrate more on my technical analysis studies. So, and speaking of technical analysis studies, it is time for the 10 and 10. So I am just going to bring that RRG right up, Tom, and then we can get started with Sally Beauty. So here are the requests, not too many, and I'm not surprised. Those were, those were some pretty interesting videos. Uh, clearly, healthcare is still of the most interest right now, Tom. I mean, it's usually technology, but now we're seeing uh, healthcare be uh, that that sector is near the top of the requests. But Anyway, there, there's the uh, traveling directions of all of these. And let's go ahead and start with uh, Sally Beauty. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got uh, SBH. And I drew a few lines on here. First, before I even get into the price action on the chart, I thought I'd look at the specialty retail group in general because we've had a really strong start to 2019 in this space. You can see that we did not only come off that low in December, but we've now gone back and taken out this triple top from back in the second half of 2018. So I thought that was really important because taking out a clear overhead resistance like that, chances are we're going to continue to see more upside movement. The problem with Sally Beauty Holdings currently is that the, it's underperforming the group. So in other words, there are better stocks in this space out there currently. Now, it's one I'd keep my eye on because it did gap up back in February, pulled back. Uh, did a little bit more than fill the gap, but when we came back down, you can see we've established short-term price support at about 1740. I would say after gapping up and pulling back, we've had a few different highs around 19. So the the uh, thicker uh, support and resistance lines are more short-term and then more distant, a little bit more intermediate term. I would be looking at these other um, highs and lows at 20, and then again at about 1640. So those are some of the price points I'd watch. Now, knowing that I've got a good group, a specialty retail group, that would make me feel a lot better about a breakout on this stock. So I'd be watching for increasing volume. Volume's just kind of been in, you know, pretty light to moderate for the past couple of months. But if we could break out above 19, see some volume coming in here, and then start to see a little relative strength versus a group, and we already know the group is good uh, on a, a relative basis, then I would be more interested in this stock. So for now, while it just languishes here in this pretty narrow trading range, I wouldn't be interested, but it's one I'd keep on my charts um, somewhere in you know a chart list so that I could refer back to it from time to time and see if we get any kind of a high volume breakout and some relative leadership. All righty, let's see next one up. The most popular in the chat room would be Roku. Yeah, Roku, I, I like. I like what it's been doing here. We saw the big sell-off from about 68 or so down to the low 60s, came back up. I think now it's turning more into a basing pattern, uh, sideways consolidation, maybe even a little bit of a cup. Um, could just be a flag off of an uptrend. Depends on what your eyes see here. But we do have an uptrend. We've got some pretty strong volume trends. And we didn't stay below that 20-day moving average long. We came back up. And on many of these moves back to the upside, you can see volume was not light. So I think Roku is just simply consolidating some massive gains. Stock ran from $27 back on December 24th low up to 75. And that was in less than three months, probably two and a half months. 
So I think the stock is entitled to a little bit of consolidation, but I do believe this is a very strong stock. And since the computer hardware stocks have started moving up, you can see Roku on a relative basis performing very well. And you can see the computer hardware on a relative basis doing well as uh, also. This is uh, the computer hardware group is the focus or one of the focus areas on the poll. You can check that out. But uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in a few minutes about computer hardware and specifically Roku. But I do like the stock. And uh, for now, I would just maybe honor the short term price support and resistance. So that recent high up here at about 74. The recent low at 60. I think we're going to continue to sideways consolidate, but I believe our next move on the stock is going to be to the upside. All right. Yes, it was the most popular. I knew you were going to be looking at it, but uh, everybody wanted it in the 10 and 10. Let's go ahead and move to Gilead Sciences, G-I-L-D. All right. Biotech's having a pretty good day, and Gilead uh, following along uh, for the ride here, making a breakout to about a five or six week high. Uh, so at least off the downtrend, hasn't been a very good performer, but it is at least starting to show some signs. We can't can't become an uptrend and an outperformer, can't get in an uptrend and outperform until we at least get above the initial resistance level. So good start here for Gilead. I think there's still a lot of other stocks that are performing better on a relative basis. So I would just caution maybe on this one that for now, on a relative basis, you've still got you know the, the stock downtrending versus its peers. And obviously, because the group hasn't been that strong, you can see it also downtrending versus the S&P 500. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, one thing that would certainly help would be to get a breakout in the group. You can see how many times we have failed at 2050. We're making that move back up again. I wrote about this group a couple weeks ago when we challenged this 1950 area and we held. That was a good sign short term. And off of the downtrend, it's a little bit of a bottoming or reversing head and shoulder pattern too. left shoulder neckline head and now we got the neckline or excuse me right side of the neckline right shoulder and we've just been drifting sideways in this range so i would maybe pay attention to the highs and lows the past two or three months and let's see which way we break but if biotechs break out gilead is at least starting to show some signs on its absolute chart and if it can start to turn up on a relative basis while we get a breakout, absolute breakout in the group, I think that would be a great sign. Still probably a little early for me here, um, but I, it's one maybe to keep an eye on, begin to watch. All righty, let's look at uh, Ericsson Telephone, E-R-I-C, of course, Eric. Yeah. All right, Eric, um, nice uptrend it remains in. Actually, I believe this one is on my strong earnings chart list. Um, the overall group telecommunications been strong. So, you know, you got a good group. That's for me. That's one of the things I start with. I like to feel like the stock market overall is going higher. And then I like to find groups that are outperforming. And if I can find that, then I can begin looking within that group for outperformers. So, again, let's highlight this. And you can see right here, I mean, this is a group relative to the S&P. This isn't just saying telecommunications is going higher. It's telling us that it's outperforming the S&P 500, which is important because that's my goal. I want to, I, there's no point in me trading if I can't outperform the S&P 500. I should just put my money in the spider. So if I can't outperform, I don't really want to be doing what I'm doing. So I think as long as you've got a group that's outperforming and you've got a stock that's outperforming, then you've got at least the makings of a winner. Now, I do think in the short term, we've got some issues here because we've been downtrending versus the peers since topping early in January. So you can kind of see that right there. That's a little bit of a concern. Um, the good news is that we could be just now getting to a key area of relative support. So this is Ericsson relative to telecommunications, the industry group. And you can see this is an area where one, two, three, four, five times the last five times we've come down to this area we bounced so if we begin to bounce again if it outperforms and you got one of the best looking groups um i would say that that's pretty good news for the stock overall so uh this is one that i would certainly consider uh get being in as long as and i would maybe look at uh that nine dollar area i think as long as it holds above nine dollars i'm fine with it all right let's see next one up a pharmaceutical uh Dicerna Pharmaceuticals, D-R-N-A. All right, not familiar with this one. 
Um, doesn't look like it trades a whole well, 163,000 today. Um, so it's a, it, it's liquid enough, um, but it is a smaller pharmaceutical. Um, I can only imagine since I have never not heard of it before. Um, but the pharmas have picked back up off of the December low. I think on a relative basis, we're still struggling, as you can see here. Just what this tells me going sideways is that pharmas are going along for the ride and they're more defensive when the market is going higher. That's really about what you're going to get. All you're going to get from defensive areas of the market. A lot of times, if you can just go along for the ride with the S&P, that's not bad. You can see that on a relative basis to the S&P, it's been performing well. Relative to the pharmas, the stock's been performing pretty well. So I would just be looking at the chart. I mean, I think this has been a pretty good one. I do like the recent breakout in the test of that support, printing a hammer. So right here, you make a move up, you pull back, you put in a higher low, you break out, you pull back. There's that hammer right on price support. And then we break out again. Now we do have a couple of areas to watch to the upside. I'm going to say 15. Well, actually, we hit it earlier today. 15 and a quarter or thereabouts up to about 1575. Might see a little bit of selling. Uh, I wouldn't be jumping in. I think that the reward to risk is not in your favor at this point. But a pullback, and I'm going to say first entry, maybe down closer to 14, um, and then the rising 20-day moving average. I think both of those areas are a couple of areas I'd keep in mind. All righty. Let's see. How about another healthcare, since there were so many? Laboratory Corp, uh, LH. Yeah, I think that was one of your upgrades this morning, right? I think it was, yes. Yeah, I, we're in a gap resistant zone and there was a lot of volume that came in on that gap down. So that anytime I see big gaps like this, I pay attention to these areas. So we gap down very heavy volume. The good news is we've gotten through the bottom of gap resistance. A lot of times that's the hard one to get through. And you can see that was previous price support too. So the fact that we were able to get up above, come down, test the 20 and move back up again, I think this is all good. Um, but there is still one major overhead area that I'd like to see taken out, and that's going to be the top of gap resistance around 162. Let's see if we can get that breakout. Until we see that, I'd probably hold off here. All righty. Let's see. The next one I am going to give you is IAC. All right. Interactive. Interactive. Yeah. Com services. Yeah, uh, triple top. Um, it's at support. Actually, I think this is, if you like the stock, this is a good time to enter. Uh, I think that this is a great reward to risk area. I believe that the stock is also on my strong earnings chart list, if I'm not mistaken. But you can see the multiple tests up around 224, 225. Just pulled back, got down to about 205, 206. And that's the, that's the level it's been holding here. That is also your gap support when we gapped up back in February, went back down. Look at that tail down below. The area of support, that's a lot of times a good sign when it comes back up above and holds. Uh, we made that nice rally afterwards. Uh, today we got down, we tested it. Um, I think anything down around the 206, 207 level makes a lot of sense here on IAC. So I'd be a fan. I think you got an uptrend, a flag, sideways consolidation, and ultimately a breakout above 225 with increasing volume would be very bullish. All righty. Let's see. The next one I have for you is DRQ. And let's see. This one is uh, Drill Quip Energy, our only energy. Yeah, I like that uh, this one is turning back to the upside. First of all, you got to, I, I immediately can see that it's outperforming its peers because this is a group that's not been doing well relative to the SP. So for the most part, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. But this has been a really nice performer and it's acting pretty good technically. I'll show you a couple of things I like here that it's done during this uptrend. First, after the gap up and the huge move up with increasing volume, the top of gap support I like. And right there it is. You come down, you test it and immediately just bounce right back off. That's why I don't like to chase on these moves because I recognize this as being the best reward to risk entry. If it doesn't work, and, you know, Arthur was on yesterday. He talks about he talked about it a lot. The fact that, hey, technical analysis is not perfect. You're not going to win every trade. you got to be prepared for it to go against you. The good news is once it falls from 43 and a half back to 38, 39, now you're back close to a key area where you expect it to hold. So now if it goes against you, you only lose maybe a dollar. If you get in at 43 and you hold it all the way down to 38 or 39, you're down 12 percent before you ever get down to a key support area. So anyway, I like that breakout. 
But then also after making this breakout above these highs, look at, we went back down, tested it, held, and nice little reversing candle, gap back up. I think we're just sideways consolidating here right now between about 44 and 47 and a half. Okay, let's see. And the very last one is going to be our only industrial, Norfolk Southern NSC. Yeah, railroads broke out yesterday to an all-time high, and NSC was upgraded yesterday. Uh, I think this is one of the better stocks out there. You can see railroads breaking out, and you can see NSC relative to the railroads breaking out. So this is a this could be a staple stock in a portfolio as far as I'm concerned. I think that's this one looks really good because I love the group and it's one of the better performers. It's making relative breakouts. It's making absolute breakouts. Um, it's kind of hard to say that there's anything here not to like. Now, because it has gone up about six, seven days in a row, a pullback down into the mid 180s would be best entry for me. But I think the stock looks great here. All right. Sounds good. And that does complete the 10 in 10. I will have all of these charts up in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the blogs articles tab, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and you will see the link to all of these symbols right there at the top. We will be right back after this message. Join us April 1st to April 5th to celebrate our 20th anniversary here at stockcharts.com with special guests, Arthur Hill, Greg Morris, Gaddis Rose, Martin Pring, and John Murphy. It is now time for our final market update. Let's see what's been going on. Right now you can see most of the markets traveling sideways, I would say. Dow Jones is down, um, well, goodness, it's down 0.37% right now. But look at the S&P 500, not really suffering too much right now, just barely down 0.08%. NASDAQ is healthy right now. The NASDAQ 100, I know, is up about 0.14%. And the NASDAQ itself, as you can see, up a little over six points. S&P 400, not looking quite as good as the other indexes. Right now, it's testing its intraday lows. Russell 2000 is also lower, down nearly a half a percent right now. The Canadian markets are mostly unchanged, but up five and a half points. The Treasury yield is down slightly, currently reading 2.487%. Volatility index, we're looking at a reading below 14 right now, 13.43. I would uh, deem that complacent as far as investors. UUP, dollar took off, but has pulled back half of the gains and is currently testing that gap support right there at about 26.05. Gold is up on the day. Looks like it's forming an intraday flag. Could see higher prices there. Currently at 121.89. USO is up over 1%, currently at 12.96. And TLT, mostly unchanged. Definitely has been pulling back uh, over the past three days, four days. And finally, let's look at the sector summary, which ones are leading. At this point, materials is our best performer, up almost a quarter of a percent with energy consumer staples on the bottom of the chart lagging down over two thirds of a percent each. And that's all I have for the final market update. What you got going right now, Tom? Yeah, um, communication services actually uh, doing pretty well today. And one of the reasons is you've got internet stocks uh, back on the move higher. So they are up more than 1%. And that's helping the NASDAQ outperform a little bit here on a relative basis. Um, I really like what's been taking place though on the internet group. We've talked about this really over the past month or two. Since we gapped up, we had already kind of broken this downtrend back in January and it started acting more bullishly. When I get a, a group like this is downtrending, a lot of times you'll see we fail at that 20 day moving average on the way down. Then we get a positive divergence, go back, we reset, move down one more time. And then when we break out, notice these pullbacks, instead of falling back below the 20, we hold the 20 and keep moving up. That is the hallmark of an uptrend. 
Now, recently on the high in uh, second week of March here, you can see we had a negative divergence, and I think that's what's been causing a more sideways action in inter internet stocks here over the past few weeks. But the group has been very strong this week so far, uh, did rally a little bit at the end of last week, and I think that it, uh, bodes really well for the group. A breakout above about 1740 is what I'm looking for on the internet stocks, and if that occurs, this is a group that you certainly want to keep on your radar. Okay, let's move into our final segment, relative strength. We've had so many guests that come on here and talked about relative strength. Of course, Julius uh, DeCampano, our regular guest, talks about RRG all the time. That's one way to evaluate relative strength. Um, you know, Aaron, you and I talk about relative strength all the time. Now we're going to have a segment based on relative strength. So what do you have? All right. Well, I decided I'll start... Uh broadly and then you can I know you're going to kind of drill down a little bit more but what I wanted to share was a couple of uh, relative charts first I'm, I'm going to show you the price relative I I've been uh, I've just added a chart like this to my decision point live chart list and Carl and I go over it on Fridays during our show at 1 30 p.m. Eastern and one of the things that I watch, of course, and I think uh, I know you watch this a lot too, Tom, is really we want to see relatively how the different indexes are doing against the S&P 500. And, you know, typically, of course, you're going to see the larger caps uh, traveling uh, and performing well with the S&P 500 during a nice rally. Uh, the, the issue right now I have is looking at what's going on with the S&P 400, you know, your mid caps and looking at the S&P 600 and what's going on with small caps. And right now, as you can see, when they aren't performing well relatively with the S&P 500, uh, you tend to not get as much um, positive action, let's put it that way. You really wanna have the small caps and mid caps participating in these moves and doing, uh, you know, start to improve relatively against the S&P 500. And right now, you know, when I looked at this chart on Friday, uh, I was feeling very encouraged in that we were starting to see some life out of these uh, relative uh, strength lines here, I'm sorry, the price relative lines and the direction they've been going in in these declining trends. And I saw a break from those declining trends. And so I think that's positive, obviously, for the market. But now that I'm looking at these charts today, I noticed that uh, the price relative for the mid caps and small caps is starting to decline and again. But it is still above that declining trend it was in before. So hopefully we can get uh, the small caps and the mid caps to start participating a bit more in what's going on. All right, the other thing I wanted to look at was just um, not really relative strength lines or price relative lines. I just wanted to look at, you know, simply what's gone on in the broad markets in general. Um, and the first one I wanted to look at uh, was looking at the equal weight for the S&P 500. And we'll look at another chart with equal weights on it. I think those are interesting as well. Um, but I wanted to just look price performance wise, you know, just to see what's been going on with price in comparison to what's been going on with the S&P 500. So let's put this uh, to memory a little bit here as I scroll down. You can see we have declining tops for the November, December area before we got that uh, really deep um, bear market move. And then we saw uh, price tops rising on the S&P 500, obviously between February and March. And we're really continuing that rising trend as we speak. So I wanted to, to take a look at what was going on at the same time. Uh, what I noticed, first of all, is that the equal weights uh, really weren't showing the same kind of strength. I do have to say, though, looking at, uh, you know, looking at the November, December, notice that those price tops uh, stayed even. We didn't get those to move downward. And I would say that looking at equal weights, typically they perform a bit better in uh, rallies than their cap weighted um, counterparts. And this might be uh, part of that reason, but we're going to look at another chart with the equal weights shortly. All right, uh, S&P 400, you can see pretty much following suit. All of these, the Dow, small caps, 
um, I didn't mark it here, but the NASDAQ 100, you can see all of those had um, declining tops. The only one that didn't was the equal weight. So I think that was uh, telling us a little something there that you know we were rather dependent on what was going on with the large caps and we were starting to see some uh, deterioration. I mean, you can see it here with the Dow and you can see it with the NASDAQ 100. Now, the interesting thing is next up, of course, are those February, March rising tops on the S&P 500 on the SPY actually is what I'm looking at. And you can see that we ended up flat here. And this really, when you look at equal weights, equal weights tend to not do as well um, uh, on the way down. Uh, they do tend to perform pretty well uh, on the upside, um, but they tend to not perform quite as well when they move on the downside. They, tr they travel faster downward than they do um, upward. Uh, so typically they will do better on a rally and uh, not as well on a decline that makes sense. So I found it interesting to see we also ended up with flat tops here on the equal weights. And you can see for the rest of the small caps, the mid caps, and of course the Dow right now, and uh, you can see, not with the NASDAQ 100, obviously a nice rising trend there, but we had these declining tops on the small caps and on the mid caps while we have uh, the S&P 500 rising. And that's that price relative chart. You know, we want to see those small caps and mid caps perform as well or, or better um, to, you know, really strengthen a, a bull market move. So the other one I was going to look at, uh, let's look at those equal weights. And then I, I think I have time to just go over those global market charts. That's a pretty um, basic one. But again, here we're looking at those declining tops and the rising tops on the SPY. And then here are the equal weights. And again, I think these are always just interesting to pay attention to. Um, but what I noticed is, again, we're still not seeing the kind of performance you'd want out of the 400s and the 400 and 600. Of course, the uh, you know equal weighted on um, you know 600 stocks isn't quite as impressive for me anyway as you see on the S and P 500 or even on the Dow. Uh, those you do have those um, you know those very large cap you know Fang stocks and that sort of thing that really can swing the index around. So sometimes looking at the equal weights, I find it interesting. And, you know, with the Dow and with the NASDAQ 100 equal weights, we're traveling in that upward direction. Uh, tells me that overall, everybody's participating as far as the NASDAQ 100 and the Dow. Uh, the, the ones that are a little bit concerning, like I said, are these S&P 400 and 600, which are just not participating. Uh, at least in this particular rising trend that we're seeing. And then finally, I'm going to end it with the global markets. And this is one we're going to start going over on Fridays as well for the Decision Point show. One of the things that uh, Carl noted and I found extraordinarily interesting is that many of the European countries are not out of their bear market yet. And you can see this by those declining tops. We haven't quite gotten uh, the breakouts yet. So with Germany, you can still, we're still on these declining tops. Look at the difference, very different from what's going on with the SPY. France, same thing. United Kingdom, still in its bear market. And the um, Japan, also looking at its bear market still. Hong Kong, you know, not too bad, uh, pretty much even on uh, the this time period. Uh, but look at uh, China. It did finally break out early in January from its declining uh, tops trend line and of course its bear market move. So found that very interesting. And then also you'll notice, of course, we had those rising tops on the SPY we keep looking at. Uh, we have a similar on Germany and France and you can say see UK. I thought it was interesting that Japan and Hong Kong, though, did not participate in, they have declining tops. Um, they're diverging right now from the SPY and the, and the American markets as far as their tops. So anyway, that's all I was going to talk about. I'm going to pass it to you, Tom, and give you some time to, I uh, can't hear you. Oh, I'm going to actually go through and 
take a look at the six um, uh, industry groups that were included in the poll. So this is going to kind of be my answer um, for the poll <laughs> as we go through it. I'll walk you through what I'm what I'm looking at here. So we've got uh, six um, groups and all relative to the S&P 500. This is a one year weekly. And I'm just going to kind of go back to the beginning of the year here first. And let's just walk through this thing, you know, this uh, movement here. So you can see um, and I'm going to highlight first the gold miners because this is one of the better performers here over the last month. Uh, gold miners have actually uh, gained over 5% in the last month. But if you look throughout the entire uptrend in the market through October, the miners were really bad performers. And then when the market got hit, uh, take a look at what's going on with the miners. So the relative strength came in when the market got very fearful. And then when the market bottomed in December, actually, if I move back here, this is January 4th. So you can see it's been accelerating. But as we make our way back through this new uh, bull market phase, look at what's going on with the gold miners. So I'm bullish. I think the market's going higher. I think we're going to be at all time highs later this year, and it might not be that far away. And so I think that that trading the miners into a bull market where they miners have been underperformers since 2011 with a rising dollar and so forth. I think that's a mistake. So I'm going to eliminate the miners. That is not a group that I would want to own. Um, next up, let's take a look at the diversified REITs. This is a defensive group. So notice the market, it was doing pretty well during that bull market as we got near the top, started rolling over. And then when the market got hit pretty hard, you can see it really accelerated. See how it turned from weakening back into leading and just accelerated to the upside? Well, that was through essentially December 21st. So once we got to the bottom and the market started performing better, you can see that this, this group has just been stuck in weakening, has not turned back up into leading throughout this rally. So I'm going to ditch it. I'm going to stay away from the REITs. I think, again, if you're in a bull market, going higher, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's what we're going to do. We're going to go higher. I don't want to be in mining stocks. I don't want to be in REITs. So then comes the other four groups, and these four all tend to do pretty well in um, uh, tend to do pretty well in terms of bull markets. Um, you normally get leadership. These are aggressive areas of the market. If we start back again a year ago, you can see broad broadline retailers stayed way over here on the right side, way right of the 100 line, which means on a relative basis, this is a group that continued to stay way out to the right, one of the best groups. When we got hit through December, you can see that the group really weakened and now with the market strengthening again, do you see the broadline retailers on a weekly basis just sitting there, not really moving back into the leading? They've, they've broken out, they're definitely doing better, but they're just stagnant with the S&P 500. I'm gonna toss them. So now I'm down to my final three. I've got the computer hardware, uh, semiconductors, and the financial administration stocks. Now, when I look at the computer hardware and we go back through the year here, you can see that we stayed mostly on the right-hand side. We got hit with the bear, that cyclical bear market. And now take a look at what's been coming back strong here into this, into this this during this rally. Huge move. If you've watched Julius, you, you uh, hear him say about these long tails. And you can see that the computer hardware group has this really long tail. I like that best of all. Um, so I'm going to pick computer hardware. But just to go through these other two, semiconductors, um, last year, we actually, in the last rally, struggled with the semiconductors, continued to struggle through all the selling. But then as soon as we picked up here in 2019, you can see the semiconductors moved back into the leading. So it's definitely a good area. Um, I think I like computer hardware a little bit better. Uh, I wouldn't frown upon owning semiconductors, and I have owned semiconductors. Um, and then you can see here financial administration hanging again over on the right hand side during the uptrend. The market got hit. And I actually like the fact that this held up really well um, when the market was getting hit back in December. So semiconductors had fallen way over here. Of course, computer hardware had taken this big hit down. Um, let me pull that one up again. See what's happening 
in December with computer hardware. So I have to say on a relative basis, that was good that we saw this kind of movement. Um, but during this rally, it's been okay. I, a very short tail on this as opposed to the computer hardware. You can see the acceleration picking up. So based on that, I would go with computer hardware. Now, there were some individual stocks that I liked within the group. So, and I, and I got these from, oh, well, before I get into that, I just want to show you quickly. Here's financial administration relative to the S&P since April of 2017. So the beautiful move up, but this has been a long period of outperformance. I'm worried that we might have one of these periods where we just pull back for a period of time. So that's something I would worry about there. Semiconductors been, had been downtrending, as I showed you on the RRG, but now they're starting to turn back up. So they look pretty good. But I really like what computer hardware, after the big hit for a couple of months last year, we're starting to turn back up again. And when you take a look at what it's done in the past, when it turns back up, it can outperform very strongly for a long period of time. So I like what's going on here. I don't have time to go over the individual stocks, but I will give those to you. Seagate Technology, STX, Roku, R-O-K-U, Diebold or Diebold, DBD, Tech Data, T-E-C-D, and uh, I think it's Mercury Computer, M-R-C-Y. They all look pretty good to me. But let's go ahead and pull up the summary. And um, there you have it. There's the relative strength, what Aaron and I looked at. And let's go ahead also and pull up the poll. So I went with computer hardware. What do you think, Aaron? What, did you um, I am, I am going to give the last place uh, some love. Broadline Retailers is actually the one I chose. And um, I... I really, here's the reason, if you look at a chart, uh, I, I don't know that I'll have time or, or be able to pull it up, but there's a flag formation, it's almost textbook, we've broken through it, and if it fulfills its uh, target, it's very interesting how the target lines up exactly with the September August, September high. So to me, it's just ready and waiting to uh, perform here. There were, on a couple of the others, I felt like there, I think with computer hardware in particular, that there were just too many layers of overhead resistance for me to get too excited about it. Yep, that's the one. I just felt like the 2700 level uh, was just going to be really difficult to get through. I mean, I think semiconductors still look okay. Uh, you know, it's the problem is a lot of these, especially financial administration chasing would be the issue. Well, I see, I mean, well, here's the computer hardware. So definitely on an absolute basis, the group's doing you know much better than it was. Mm -hmm. um, here is the semiconductor group that you were just referring to. This is a group I think that's been very strong as well. Nice little cup, I think there. And mm -hmm. then finally, the group that uh, you had mentioned was the Broadline right. Retailers. And Broadline Retailers did make this break out above this triple top. Still got a little bit of overhead resistance from some of these prior highs, but uh, certainly has uh, broken out of that range. That bothered me for a while, but we did get that breakout, which was good. Yeah, I feel like it's been sort of um, uh, depressed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now uh, as we rally, we probably will see some, some better action there. But yeah, it, it was interesting. <laughs> I think yesterday my Monday setups were at the bottom. Uh, I picked the bottom choice. <laughs> hey, that's fine. Not a, not a problem. I do want to just mention we got the Dow still down 96 points. The S or the uh, Nasdaq up 11. S and P down a point and a half, roughly, and the Russell 2000 down four and a half. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everyone, and come back on Wednesday. We got another day of uh, stock charts anniversary. We got another special show coming up. Happy trading.